with uh, King of Hearts tonight, and so you guys have um, your your paper. Anybody remember where we started with this? What? The need for a king? Huh? Okay, Alida, you said it? You said the correct thing. That is right. A need for a king. And then who remembers what the next group of uh, lessons was about? Jade? What was that, a little bit louder? What the king requires. That's right. And so tonight we're going to continue um, looking at this series. And... Um, you know, one thing that I hope you see in this is that um, Saul gives us a really good example of what not to do. Anybody ever see those people like, this is what you don't do. Um, I went on Monday and watched the varsity track meet at uh, ESU, and I saw a kid running a race, and fortunately he didn't make the mistake, but he looked behind him in a race. How many of you runners know that's what you don't do? right? You don't look behind you in a race because what happens? You fall down, right? So this kid was on a, a straightaway. Fortunately, he was not, he was on the inside track, but he, he didn't fall down. But as soon as he turned, I said, oh, you're not supposed to do that. He was trying to see how far ahead he was. And uh, he did end up winning that race, but that's not normally what happens. But in the life of King Saul, we see that uh, what did, what was Saul's main problem if you had to sum all of his problems up down to say one thing anybody what would you think that would be pride. <coughs> pride would be a good one and what's the essence of pride what's the root of pride is that you think you can huh do anything kind of you think you can do it your own way right it doesn't matter what somebody else says if you're prideful you think that your way is better right and so that's what Saul's problem was. He, he kept doing things his own way. And uh, the last two weeks, we looked at the fact that Saul's kingdom was taken away from him, right? His lineage um, was, was promised that they would not be the king. His kingdom was given to somebody else, and his authority was stripped away from him because he said, I can do it my way instead of doing it God's way, right? So tonight, uh, we, this is kind of where we ended uh, the last couple of weeks, is that uh, Samuel was sent to find a new king. Anybody remember? We read just the very beginning of this story, um, but anybody know whose family he went to? Trip? Jesse's. Yeah, he went to Jesse's family. So uh, we're going to look at how um, he went to see a son of Jesse, and we're going to talk about the royal family. Okay, so if you have your Bible or Bible app or it's on the screen, you can follow along there. Um, but we're going to look at 1 Samuel 16 and, and verse 7 here in a minute. But just to get kind of give you a background, I'm not going to read the whole story of the encounter with Saul, Samuel and Jesse. But Jesse had 11 sons. That's a lot of sons, right? 11 sons. I'm only holding six because I can't do 11 because if I have to do this, like, right? So... <coughs> Ten of Jesse's sons were ready when Samuel showed up. And the oldest one is named Eliab. And Eliab must have been like Israel's, you know, GQ man of the year or something. He was tall. He was good looking. He was strong. And as soon as Samuel saw him, he thought, surely this is the one that the Lord has chosen. Because just look at him, right? <clears throat> there must have been a little bit of a bromance between Samuel and Eliab. Because he's like, dude, that's the one. And if we look here at verse 7, we see the Lord's response to that. I'm sorry, I have something in my throat. There we go. So 1 Samuel 16, verse 7 says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Don't be impressed by his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. What? How did that happen? God does not view things the way men do. People look on the outward appearance but the Lord looks at the heart. So Samuel was kind of on the same path of making the same mistake that he made with Saul, right? Because we know Saul was taller than everyone else. He was good looking. He was strong. He was a good military leader. But he was the worst king. I mean, in Israel's history, really, he wasn't the worst. There were a lot of really bad kings. But Saul started off really bad. And so God said that it's not, you know, don't make that same mistake again. Um, it's not 
based off the outward appearance of this person. I, uh, they're not, that's not the qualifications that I'm looking for. And so if you were to look in your Bible at the next uh, verses 8 through 10 of 1 Samuel 16, you'd see that Jesse then goes down the line, starting with the oldest, Eliab, and he goes down the line uh, of his sons, his top 10, right? And he goes right down the line, and each and every one, the, the, the Lord's response is, this is not the guy, right? So out of 11 sons, 10 are present, the best looking, the strongest, the firstborn is not chosen, and then he goes right down the line, none of the 10 are chosen, and so look at what Samuel said in verse 11. He says, Then Samuel said to Jesse, Is that all the young men? Jesse replied, They're still the youngest one, but he's taking care of the flock. Samuel said to Jesse, Send and get him, for we cannot turn our attention to other things until he comes here. So Jesse's top 10 list resulted in zero kings being selected. And here we see the youngest son was not even a runner up. For the, for the king contest, right? He was not even in the selection pool. He didn't make it in any of the qualifying rounds. Everybody else was said, hey, Jesse's like, hey, my top 10 sons, you're at the feast. Runt, you're out in the field. You're not even gonna get to be in this part. And so they go through the whole thing looking on the outward appearance. And I want you to think about that for a minute. If you know anything about the Old Testament, the, the name of David the name of King David, the son of Jesse, is all throughout the Old Testament. From this point forward, you keep seeing the name of David come back. And when it was time to consider the next king, he didn't even make the top 10 list. Right? He was just a shepherd boy. Nobody even thought for a minute that he would be the one. But as you read through that story in 1 Samuel 16, the moment that David shows up, he's smaller than everybody. It says he's, he's probably got red hair and he's, he's, uh, you know, he's good looking, but he's, he's the runt of the litter. And as soon as Samuel sees him, he knows this is the guy. Anoint him. Now we can continue. I want you to write this down. God doesn't care about size, strength, or age. God cares about your heart. It's not about your size. It's not about your strength. It's not about how old you are or uh, how young you are. God is looking for people whose heart is turned to him, who's surrendered to him. Just think about that. The only prerequisite, prerequisite for God to use you in a really big way in your life right now is your willingness to give him your heart. That's what God wants. There's once an evangelist who was in the city of Chicago. Pastor Tony mentioned him on Sunday. His name is D.L. Moody. And there's a Bible Institute today that's named after this man. But he made this statement, the world has yet to see what God can do with a person fully surrendered to him. Meaning, that it's not about your talent, it's not about your, your ability, it's not about the house you grew up in, it's not about any of those things. If you fully surrender your heart to God, incredible things can happen through your life. Because you serve an incredible God. And you plus God is a majority in any circumstance you find yourself in. And so that's the kind of, uh, David was this next level king of Israel because he was different. It wasn't because of his military prowess, although he proved himself a great military leader. It wasn't because of his cunning or his economic um, smarts, but he did prove that he could build up the economy. It wasn't for any of those things, but the Bible time and time again calls David a man after God's own heart. And we see that in Acts chapter 13, Verse 22, Paul is speaking to some Israelites and he says this, after removing him, talking about King Saul, God raised up David, their king. He testified about him. I have found David, the son of Jesse, to be a man after my heart who will accomplish everything I want him to do. So the, the key to God accomplishing incredible things in your life is will you surrender your heart to him completely? David's security came from the fact that he 
knew God. He, was, he, he belonged to God. It wasn't the fact that he was in the, the premier spot in his family because he was the youngest of his brothers. It wasn't because he was the strongest or the best looking because he was the smallest, the least in the family. But he knew that he could become a part of God's royal family because God said, you are going to be the king. And I want you to write this down. When you give your heart to God, you believe that you are who he says you are. David, the smallest, the one that didn't make the top 10 list, he was not even considered to be in the running for what was about to happen, knew that he was part of a royal family. He was the start of a royal family because God said, you're going to be the king. I've chosen you and I've set you apart. And you see that, that he went on to, um, to live this out. He, he began to live as a king. As, as you look at the story of David and Goliath, the, maybe the most famous story of David's life, none of the army would go and face Goliath. He was too much of a, of a powerful warrior. You know, the, the Navy SEAL commandos of Israel's army were afraid to go down into the valley and face Goliath. But here comes David, shepherd boy, just came out of the field taking care of the sheep. And he goes, he doesn't, he doesn't put on the best armor and get the best weaponry. He, he says, I'm going to do what I know how to do. And he goes and he gets five stones. And some people think that maybe he was going to go after Goliath's five brothers after, uh, four brothers after he took care of Goliath. But he took five stones, put them in his little pouch, got his little sling, and he went down into the, the field. And he, he took the best Philistine warrior out because he knew that God plus him was a majority. He knew that when God said, you're my king, then basically David's invincible at that point because God said, I'm going to be the king, so nothing's going to stop me from fulfilling God's promise in my life. And he knew that God would supply all that he needed to face that enemy because he had learned that lesson in the field. God was looking for this shepherd boy because the shepherd boy knew how to take care of the sheep. He knew how to, how to care for people. And when the, when the lion came up and tried to steal the sheep, David dealt with that lion just like he dealt with Goliath. He went out and ripped it apart. And when the bear came and tried to steal his sheep, David knew that that bear is not going to take any of my sheep today. And he went and took care of the bear. And he said, this, this Philistine is just like those animals in the field because God is with me. Because God said, I'm the king. Then he was the king, right? And when you give God your heart, you believe that he, you are who he says you are. But when you find your security and what people say about you, then you don't know who you are. It changes your perspective. And we see that played out in the life of Saul. I would encourage you guys this week to go through and read these chapters in 1 Samuel before David officially takes the throne while Saul is still the king and David is, the, is serving him. Um, Saul listens to the lies of, the, uh, of people around him or he listens to what the people around him are saying, and he, he bases his value off of what other people are saying, right? And <clears throat> I found it interesting in the song, uh, Free From It All, Lecrae said, if you live for people's acceptance, you'll die by their rejection. And you see that truth played out in the life of Saul. Because as soon as uh, David came up, David went and he, he defeated Goliath and, and the, the Israelites, so uh, the Philistine army is on this, uh, this t they're running away from Israel, and, and uh, David is the man, and he is leading the people. As soon as uh, they start going around, people start singing songs. And look at this, what the women say. The women start singing this song, and it says that uh, in 1 Samuel 18, 7, Saul is struck down as thousands, but David his tens of thousands. After one battle, Saul had defeated armies for the Lord already. And actually, the truth of this is that, that really Saul had defeated tens of thousands in comparison to David's singular victory. But Saul listened to this, and he became jealous of this man who had won a great victory for Israel. And then he goes and he tries to kill him time and time again. And so if you read through this, this story in 1 Samuel, um, it sets Saul on this path of destruction. And we see four things played out in the life of Saul that will play out in your life if you choose to find your identity in what people say about you. 
I want you guys to write these things down. The first thing, if, you're, if your identity is found in what other people are saying about you instead of what God is saying about you, then the first thing you do is you get angry when your identity is found in what people say about you. You find yourself saying things like, you know, why didn't that person hang out with me last night? Or, or why does she keep making those stupid posts? I know they're about me, even though they don't say my name. I know she's saying stuff about me. And then you're like, man, why, why didn't they invite me to go to the bonfire with them? I wanted to go and hang out. Why didn't they invite me? Or, or why did that teacher give me that bad grade? I know I didn't finish all the work, but she knew that I had stuff going on. Right? And you start getting angry because your identity is found in what people say. The second thing that happens is, is you get jealous. In the life of Saul, if you read through this story in Samuel, he got angry with David. And even though David's trying to soothe him by playing some really sweet music, Saul chucks a spear at him, tries to pin him to the wall with a spear. And then, um, and then the th- he, he got angry. Then you get jealous. And, and in the life of Saul, man, that he heard that story. He heard that song about the, what the women were saying. Man, man I, I'm the one that defeated all those armies. David only defeated one guy. How can they say that? And you get jealous. And that's what happens to you. You know, when, when your friends get another friend and you're like, wait, you were supposed to be my friend. You can't be their friend. We're BFFs. You can't let somebody else come and you become jealous of their time and their attention because your identity is in what people say and not who God or not what God says you about you. The third thing that happens is you get paranoid. In the life of Saul, man, he started seeing uh, people. He started seeing people that were faithful to him as people that were trying to betray him. And you see that in the story. And the same thing happens in your life. You, you might get a text and you read it and you reread it and you re 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 read it and you re 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 read it. And you, then before you know it, you've read something into it that was never intentionally there. And you start stalking people on social media and thinking that every move that somebody makes, everything, every gesture that they make is, made, is intended to make you mad because your identity is found in what people say and then you get paranoid. And then the last step in that is you get manipulative, right? In the life of Saul, that played out because we're going to see here in a minute that Saul's son, Jonathan, he loved David like a brother from another mother. They were like tight. They were close. And Saul tried to manipulate that relationship to bring David down. But what happens in your life when you find your identity in what people say instead of what God says, you get manipulative. And when you feel like you're losing control of a situation, you manipulate people's feelings. You manipulate uh, the situation to try and fall in your favor and make everybody else look bad. And like I said, those verses, 1 Samuel 18, verses uh, 1 Samuel chapter 18 through chapter 31, you'll see each of these characteristics play out in the life of Saul because his identity was in what people said. And when your identity is found in things other than Jesus, it shifts your view of reality so that you're angry and you're jealous and you're paranoid and you're manipulative. But we see a different story in the life of Jonathan. Right In verses 3 and 4 of Ma- of Sam- 1 Samuel 18, says this, Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him. He gave it to David in his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. So j- really, Jonathan was the next in line to be king after Saul. And here comes David, who God says is going to be king, And rather than be jealous and angry and manipulative and paranoid about him, he sees someone that he can become close to and someone that he can rely on and someone that that he can he can trust. And instead of keeping everything back, he basically gives David the keys of the kingdom. He gives him everything that he needs as a warrior to go to battle because he wasn't afraid of losing. And Jonathan serves as this incredible Example, you know, he even says he gives him his robe, his royal robe. He took off his own shoulders and put onto David. I want you to write this down. Your identity can be found in the thing you refuse to lose. Your identity can be found in the thing that you refuse to lose. You know, you think about what's that one thing in your life that if you lost it, you would feel like you lost it all. Maybe it's a a BFF. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a video game. 
Maybe it's a sport or a hobby. You think, man, if I lost this one thing, then everything, man, everything would be different. And you think about this. If that one thing isn't God, you're setting yourself up for failure. I was just talking to somebody this week that they, they had a, a close relationship with a friend that they trusted, and, and that friend broke their trust, and now they feel like they can't trust anybody. They feel like they just need to keep their distance from everybody because they're just going to get hurt again. Is that the life that God wants us to live? No, it's because they, they put too much stock in this single person, and they've got to increase their trust in God Knowing that whatever happens, good or bad, God can lead them in the right way. You know, let Jesus be that one thing because he'll never leave you. He'll never fail you. He never lets us down like we were just singing. There's an old song that says, you can have the whole world, but give me Jesus. And we see that played out in the life of Jonathan. We see that David was that man. And I want you guys to remember this point. When you give God your heart. You believe that you are who he says you are. But when you listen to what other people say about you, all of your reality gets twisted and distorted. Next week, we are going to look a little bit more deeply into this idea, but I want to kind of give you a preview about some of the things that we're going to look at. Like I said, next week, we'll do our small groups, and we'll look more. I just want to read through these quickly. But God's word has a lot to say about who Christians are in, in Christ. And the first thing is this. You are God's special possession. I'm going to read these really quickly. 1 Peter 2.9 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. In Jesus, you are a world changer. Jesus said in John 15, verse 16, You did not choose me, but I chose you and anointed you, appointed you, that you should go and bear fruit, that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask, in the, uh, ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. You are worth more than Jesus' life. You guys realize that? Think about that. You're worth more than Jesus' life. So if anybody says you're worthless, they're a liar. Because 1 John 3, 16 says, We have come to know love by this, that Jesus laid down his life for us. Thus, we ought to lay down our lives for our fellow Christians. You are lavishly forgiven. That means incredibly forgiven. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our offenses according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. You are his child, and nothing can change that. 1 John 3, 1 says, See what sort of love the Father has given to us that we should be called God's children. And indeed we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it does not know him. You are a part of God's royal family. You are who he says you are. Can I pray for you guys tonight? Lord, I pray that that truth would sink deeply into our hearts tonight. Lord God, that those of us in this room, that we would stop listening to the lies of people around us. And Lord, instead, I pray that you would help us to choose to listen to what you say about us. Your word is full of incredible promises for those that are in Christ, those that are walking a Christian life. We have incredible promises given to us of our identity in you, of our place in your royal family. And Lord, I pray that you would help each and every one of us through the remainder of this week to walk as children of God walking in light and not in darkness. Jesus, we love you, we thank you, and we ask this in the power of your name. Amen.